thank you for tuning in today. My name is Rachel Diner. I'm a postdoctoral researcher in the Gilbert Lab at the University of California, San Diego. And today I'll be talking about pathogenic vibrio species in Southern California coastal waters. And I'd like to begin by thanking my collaborators at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, the J. Craig Venter Institute and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So there are several different species of vibrio bacteria that can cause human disease. The most common are Vibrio perihemolyticus, Vibrio alginolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio cholera. And to, to the right, there's an image of Vibrio vulnificus, a wound infection, a particularly nasty one. And these are also known as flesh-eating bacteria, um, and they have a very high mortality rate. So Vibrio cholera can cause the disease cholera. This is usually transmitted through drinking contaminated water. So we don't actually see a lot of that in the United States, but all of the other Vibrio infections are collectively known as Vibriosis. So these bacteria live naturally in marine and brackish coastal waters. There are about 80,000 cases of Vibriosis each year in the United States, and the majority of them are foodborne infections. So this especially occurs when people consume raw oysters, but there are also wound infections, ear infections, and septicemia. Cases of Vibriosis are on the rise globally and also in the United States. And these are linked to warm temperatures. So both seasonal warm temperatures during the summer and climate change. And this is because Vibrios really like warm temperatures. And so we see higher Vibrio abundances and faster growth rates. And because of this, the geographic range of pathogenic species is also increasing. Additionally, there's more recreational water activity in the summer. So you're seeing this combination both of more people using the water and more Vibrios in the water. Um, and this figure to the bottom right is from the CDC. And this is just showing that there are in fact more cases during the late summer months. So why are we concerned about Southern California? Well, we see very heavy beach and ocean use by locals and tourists. And we also have recreational and commercial shellfish harvesting. Additionally, our warm waters might be representative of areas further north. So if we're seeing a lot of Vibrios in our waters now, then areas farther north of us might be seeing more Vibrios in the future. Also, we do see more infections in the summer. So this is from San Diego County. We see the most infections during the late summer months. And also these cases have increased over time. So this figure from to the bottom right is from 2003 to 2019. You can see an increase of vibriosis cases. And these numbers are for San Diego, but they're very similar for Los Angeles County as well. So this is a Southern California issue. So our questions are, which pathogenic vibrio species are abundant in Southern California coastal waters and in what environmental conditions they occur? Do they possess virulence or antibiotic resistance genes that might be of concern to human health? And we're also interested in other questions such as what potential vectors they're associated with in the environment, uh, including algae and copepods, and also how do the concentrations in the water relate to the concentrations in our local oysters? And these latter two points I won't be discussing in this talk, but if you're interested in learning more, uh, please feel free to reach out and talk to me about it. So we conducted a study in San Diego from 2015 to 2016. Uh, we looked at five different sites monthly for one year. Um, those sites were located at Los Penasquitos Lagoon, the San Diego River, and the Tijuana River Estuary. And we quantified Vibrio perihemolyticus, Vibrio vulnificus, and Vibrio cholera using digital droplet PCR. We also conducted amplicon and shotgun sequencing to learn more about what organisms the Vibrios were associated with and what um, genes these Vibrios possess that were of interest to human health. And on the right side, we have some of the environmental data we collected, including temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll A. I'd like to draw your attention to the top right figure, which is temperature. This red line is 20 degrees C, and this is the temperature at which, above which pathogenic Vibrio species are known to proliferate. Um, and what we found was that at all sites and during most months of the year, our water temperatures exceeded this threshold. And so we did actually expect to see some of these Vibrios in our waters. And that is what we found. So we found that pathogenic species were abundant and that they were linked to distinct temperature and salinity profiles. So to orient you to this figure on the left, we have Vibrio perihemolyticus at the top, vulnificus in the middle and cholera at the bottom. The size of the circle represents the number of copies per 100 milliliters. So that's representative of the abundance. And these range from a maximum of about 10,000 copies per 100 milliliter for vulnificus 
up to about 280,000 copies per milliliter for, for Vibrio cholera. The color is the site and the left, uh, the y-axis is temperature and the x is salinity. So basically, as you go to the right and up, you're seeing warmer, higher salinity conditions and to the bottom left, you're seeing lower salinity and lower temperature. And we found that Vibrio perihemolyticus on the top was associated with higher temperatures significantly. And this is interesting because this is the species that's responsible for most of the infections, both in San Diego and the United States. Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio cholera were also found in warmer temperatures, but they were significantly associated with lower salinities. Um, also, there were some interesting local issues. So the highest concentration we saw of Vibrio cholera was about 2,800 copies per milliliter. So not 100 milliliters, but per milliliter. Um, and what happens is every year at Los Penasquitos Lagoon, the lagoon closes up just due to natural coastal processes and fresh water from the surrounding area fills in the lagoon. And it was during this time period that Vibrio cholera was prol proliferating. And then each year they dredge out the mouth of the lagoon and then the contents then spill out into the um, adjacent coastal area. And so that's interesting and also a little bit concerning. We also, um, we cultured these vibrios on chrome agar vibrio media. <clears throat> so these plates are designed um, to grow these pathogenic species and they turn different colors. So on this plate, the dark blue is vibrio vulnificus, presumptive vibrio vulnificus. Light blue is cholera and purple is parahemolyticus. And so basically we collected these vibrios and then we did shotgun sequencing on them. And what we found was that we were able to detect species specific virulence genes for both Vibrio vulnificus and Vibrio parahemolyticus. We did not detect the CTXA gene, which is representative of Vibrio cholera species that can cause the disease cholera. However, even without this gene, Vibrio cholera can still cause vibriosis. We also detected several different classes of antibiotic resistance genes, and these were found at all sites and all months. And so these findings are interesting because vibrios can pretty rapidly exchange both virulence and antibiotic resistance genes through horizontal gene transfer. Um, so finding these in our populations is a bit concerning. Um, additionally, there were more human and animal pathogenic species that we detected, including Vibrio alginolyticus. And this species is the second most common cause of infections in San Diego. And I wanna talk briefly about a study that we're working on right now um, in Newport Bay, which is just north of San Diego in Orange County. This effort was led by Dr. Amy Zimmer Faust at the Southern California Coastal Water Research Project. Um, we collected both water and oyster samples from 12 different sites in Newport Bay over six weeks during the summer. And we're quantifying human pathogens and indicator species and also Vibrio, so Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus. And as you can see from these images, um, we collected from a range of different environments in the Bay. And what we found, or what we found so far, we're still actively working on this data set, is that pathogenic species are most abundant at sites with higher temperatures and lower salinities. So on the x-axis, we have the sites from 1 to 13, and these go from the mouth of the Bay to the back Bay. And as you go towards the back Bay, the temperature increases slightly, and the salinity stays the same until you reach the back bay and then it drops pretty substantially. And just above these bar plots, we have the average number of Vibrio parahemolyticus and Vibrio vulnificus per 100 milliliters. And this was quantified using the same digital droplet PCR assay that we did for the San Diego study. And we find that there are higher average concentrations at these low salinity and warm temperature sites, which is similar to what we were finding in the San Diego data set. So questions that we're looking at now are, are these concentrating in the oysters? And also what is the actual risk to human health? So we know that these species are abundant. Um, we don't know how many of them possess virulence genes, but we're trying to find that out. And then we wanna actually extrapolate and find out what the risk to human health is. Um, so Emily Cooksey, who is a graduate student at the University of Arizona is doing quantitative risk assessments to try to find that out. So in conclusion, pathogenic Vibrio species are more abundant in coastal Southern, in Southern California coastal waters. Uh, maybe not more than we expected, but this was the first time we've ever quantified them. So it was kind of surprising. And some of them possess virulence and antibiotic resistance genes. Also increasing temperatures might increase the infection risk, uh, particularly for Vibrio parahemolyticus in the future. 
and low salinity events, including urban runoff and rainfall may increase the abundance of species such as Vulnificus and cholera. Um, also, we might need additional screening in the future for other species such as Vibrio alginolyticus. And with that, um, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators uh, at JCDI, SCORP, UCSD, and also my funding sources, which are the NSF and the NIH-funded San Diego Iraqta program. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>